Father, we thank you for your, uh, your word this morning as we open it. We go line by line, verse by verse, God, just to understand what it means and see the applications to our lives, God. We ask that you do that, Lord. Uh, give us a meal, Father, uh, something to munch on, to chew on, Lord, uh, something to go in and, and to change us, Lord. Align our, our hearts with your hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the, this morning I was looking at getting through verse uh, 20. 3 through 38, called the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are full. I didn't quite get through that the first service. We'll see how I do here this service. Last week we shared that the disciples of John the Baptist, they came up to Jesus and asking them a question regarding fasting. And, and Jesus shared with them that God was doing a new work through the bridegroom this new work that he talked about, he met a metaphor, and he talked about, he called it new wine. And he talks about that this new wine that was made at the time, when you add yeast to grapes, as we talked about the grapes uh, there, the sugar they provide, the yeast, yeast are chomping down on the sugar, and the waste products of the yeast is alcohol and carbon dioxide. And so you get this fermenting, this, this bubbling effect as this yeast is making alcohol, making wine. And it says you put new wine into what? New wineskins. Because they're elastic. They're able to spread and stretch. And so as, as the fermenting wine would grow, the skin would also what? Grow with that at that time. He says, but you don't put new wine in an old wineskin that's already been stretched. That's not his purpose. That's not his function anymore. You'd have to put old wine that's no longer fermenting into an old wine bag. But you don't put new wine into an old wine bag because the new wine is going to continue to what? Ferment and bubble and expand. But that, 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 that container, that wineskin, won't be able to expand anymore. And instead, it will actually break. Two things would happen. The wineskin would break no longer be functional, and number two, the wine would pour out and be of no value anymore. So he says you put new wine in a new wineskin. And this metaphor that he was giving them about an old patch and the wineskin and the bridegroom was, was all intended to let the, these uh, disciples of John the Baptist know that through Christ, a whole new way was occurring. God was doing a new work through Jesus Christ. And the new work isn't going to be contained in Judaism. See, Judaism was about keeping the laws and the rules. It had to do every year you had to annually go year after year after year for your sacrificing of your sins, right? And the next year you'd have to take your sheep and you have to go down to Jerusalem and sacrifice your sins. And over and over and over. But Jesus was saying, that's going to come to an end, and a new way, a new covenant was going to begin through him, the bridegroom, in which once and for all, by his death on the cross, the one sacrifice, all of us are made clean once and for all. Not just a covering for a year, but actually the removing of our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's a whole new work. And that work isn't going to be part of Judaism. It's going to be a whole new work where God's going to bring the Gentile and the Jewish together in one of what we call the church. So a new wineskin had to start, and that's what we are, the church. The bride of the bridegroom, the bride of Christ that he's talking about. And so through the death and resurrection that God would do a brand new work, a new covenant, a new wine that's no longer part of the wineskin. Now, we're going to have communion at the end of the service, and when Jesus takes the cup, he says, this is a what? The new covenant. See, a new relationship, a new thing that's going to be happening, and this is where we kind of get that from this portion here that's no longer part of Judaism. I wanted to clarify that part here. Well, while he's talking with these Jude, with these, with these uh, disciples of John the Baptist, he's interrupted by a leader of the local synagogue there in Capernaum. His name is Jairus. And there was something dire on his heart. His, his daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, was dying. And so he comes up and he, he says, I want you to come with me and come to my house. So Jesus leaves the disciples of John the Baptist, is now going with Jairus over to Jairus' house so that Jesus can lay his hands on his daughter and heal her. And as he's on the way from one ministry to go to another ministry, 
Suddenly we realize that this woman who's been sick for 12 years, interesting, 12-year-old daughter who's now dying, the entire time Jairus' daughter has been alive, this woman has been in what? Total pain and agony, probably a, a menstrual uh, a flow of blood, cramps and pain, anemia, uh, exhausted. And it, it said that she had spent all that she had. It says suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I will be made well. This is a desperate woman at this time. Again, we read that she was financially broke. She spent all that she had, and she was no more better. She was financially broke. She was sick. Not only that, she was spiritually unclean. If a woman had a flow of blood from her, or anybody had any type of blood oozing out in any place, they had to be put outside and declared unclean for five days, and they could be brought back in. But she was constantly had a flow. She was always spiritually ostracized. She couldn't even go to church as a result of that. And so this broken, embarrassed woman believes and steps out of faith that, that there's power in Jesus, and if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made healed. We saw that there's a value in this point of contact. The hem of the garment, she believed, was to release her faith. Now, there is no hocus pocus or, or things in anybody's hymns, but there is some power in believing in Jesus Christ that if I, if I step out by faith, he can meet me where I am. And so she quietly, discreetly comes up to Jesus behind to touch the, the border. And it says when she does touch it, immediately her, the flow of her blood stops. It says in Matthew 8, 9, 22, but Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. See, she released her faith when she believed and touched the hem of garment would, of Jesus would heal her, and she was healed. And Jesus said, stop everything. Stop the show. <clears throat> Something happened. And all of a sudden, he looks around. I'm sure Jairus we talked about. So well, hold on. We're right. we got a pretty important thing we got to get to. But that's where we left off last week. Your faith has made you well, and he said it out loud. And I think it's neat, we talk about we get busy going from one ministry to another ministry, but this woman's life was totally changed because Jesus touched her. In the midst of her, her life went from what? Being, couldn't go to church, couldn't be healed, sick, to all of a sudden being changed instantly. And we talked about how often last week we're from one ministry and we're going to another ministry and we can just get just constantly focused on the next thing and the next thing. My mind works very much in big projects. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, okay, we have, we were going to Kentucky, then we have, you know, we're, we got the, uh, going to Mexico, then we got the family camp, and then we got an outreach. You know, an outreach, and I'm thinking, and it's easy to forget that in the midst of this, there's what? Ministry happening. Right now is ministry happening. Having brick and bread is ministry happening. Caring about people right now is ministry happening. Doing things right now is important, is valuable. And unlike you, I mean, I can get so busy from going here to here, I'm forgetting my, the very kids in my home. I'm forgetting responsibilities and ministry that God has given me. I forget about this man and this woman that he's given me, or my sister and my brother who have needs also, because I get so self-consumed and overwhelmed and self-focused. And here, Jesus is going from one ministry to another man of the ministry, and right in the midst of that, a woman gets healed. Life changed forever. And as a result, Jesus stops and says, your faith has made you well. See, Jesus wanted this <clears throat> woman to know that she was healed. And she wanted all the people to know that she was healed. And she wanted Jairus, who is probably the leader of her synagogue, to know what? She was healed. Well, she had a very personal problem. That's a very, right, personal problem. The fact that she wasn't going to church was a public knowledge. And now everyone knows this woman should be welcomed in the fellowship. If, you've, if you haven't been in fellowship for a period of time because you're down and you're sick, you know how you miss it, how you miss coming to fellowship and, and encouraging and talking and praying. You miss, you miss being together, that, that fire, you know, coals keep you stoked and on fire for the Lord. And just the hugs, just the care, this woman now will get that again and wanted Jairus to know she should be welcomed back 
into the ministry too. But not only that, Jesus wanted everyone to know why she was healed. She was healed because her what? Faith. Your faith has made you healed. It wasn't some hocus pocus of just touching a him. It was, it was not faith in faith, but faith in Jesus. See, we live in this time where, where if you just believe and conceive and achieve, you can do whatever you want. And it's this faith in faith. You can call things into existence by the power that you have. You can just believe, and you just don't, you know, if you just believe harder, you'll be healed. And we got this belief in belief. Well, how about belief in Jesus? Jesus is the object of her faith. And she wanted everyone to know that your faith in, your faith in me has what healed you. That's where you always should do that. Faith in faith is not biblical, but the object of her faith was Jesus that healed her. Now, God also knows the beginning from the end, right? And I, I constantly am amazed to, to realize that as Jairus is sitting here, I, I, I kind of put my, my, myself in, in where Jairus is. What are you doing with this woman? You, my, my daughter's what? Dying. Come with me, JC. Come on. We've got to take care. Come on, Jesus. I need your help. Oh, no, there's something else right in the midst of that that also needs some help, too. And I need to call. And that's not what happens. But you've got to know what? Look what happens here. It says, verse 49 of Luke 8, Well, Jesus was speaking to the woman. Well, Jesus was telling the woman, Your faith has made you well. Someone came up from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said to Jairus, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. You see what's happening? I, I see this movie climax kind of occurring. Jairus is heading there. Heading home. This woman just gets healed. Jesus declares the reason that she is healed is because of her faith. And now he has a situation where somebody, the bearer of bad news, comes up and says, don't go anymore. Your daughter died. Don't, don't trouble the teacher anymore. And I just stop and I think, what is Jairus going to do? What, what, what is he going to do? You know, a similar situation happened to a couple of Jesus' friends, close, close friends that lived in, in Bethany. Their name was Mary and Martha, and they had a brother by the name of who? Lazarus, right. And they sent a message to Jesus, and he was way off, and says, Jesus, you know, the, the one that you love, Lazarus, is dying. Come home and touch and heal him. Well, Jesus spent a couple more days. So by the time that Jesus got to where Mary and Martha was to their home, Lazarus had died. Now, he was good friends with them. He stayed with them there. It was just over the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. That's where he was staying then, come over into Jerusalem. But as he goes, he, listen and watch this. John 11 says, now Martha said to Jesus, when Jesus finally arrived, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Not, hey, how you doing, Jesus? Good to see you. It's like, where were you? Why didn't you come in time? We told you he was six. Why did you delay? Why weren't you there? Not only did Martha, but in verse 32 of John 11, Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him. She fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Where were you, Jesus? Well, we know the story. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? We know the story. But what is Jairus going to do? He got the same delay. Is he going to say, Jesus, why did you delay with this woman? If you would have come with me, my daughter would have been what? Healed. Well, what are you doing? What are you doing, Jesus? What's happening here? <clears throat> I love reading the Word of God because we get to see behind the curtain. We get to see the whole thing that happens. You know what I mean? And, and like behind the curtain, we see that Jairus, who's the leader of the synagogue, he's the one who's supposed to be the spiritual one, sees this woman who's been ostracized from from worshiping God for, what, 12 years, show total faith and reach out to Jesus. And Jesus declare, your faith has made you whole. Then it's kind of like, how about you, Jairus? Do you have faith too? How far is your faith going to go? You see, I think Jesus wanted to increase Jairus' faith. All these things are happening all at once. I mean, it's for the people, it's for Jairus, it's for the woman, but I think it's also for Jairus' faith to grow. 
for the woman to be healed, but for Jairus' faith to grow. She just saw an incredible miracle on his way. Because we read that Jesus jumps into this conversation between this bearer of bad news and with Jairus, and it says in Luke 8, 50, but when Jesus heard it, he answered saying to Jairus, hey, Jairus, do not be afraid. Only believe, and she would be made well. In other words, don't fear. Fear and faith do not go together. Believe. Only believe, Jesus. Believe. How, how much do you want me to believe? Believe like that desperate woman. Believe as much as she's going to believe. Have faith as much as that woman right there, Jairus. You're going to have that much faith? You're the leader of the synagogue. Where's your faith? Are you going to have that much faith? What are you going to do? It's kind of like this climax of the movie. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, where were you, Jesus? What's happening? I just feel this, this, this whole thing happening. And then we read in verse 23 of chapter 9 of Matthew, when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. And I go, yes, he went to the house. He believed. He didn't give up. He because said, Jesus, we're going to go. I believe you, we're going to keep on going. Only believe, and he believed. I think sometimes, you know, God speaks to our hearts, and, and we read his word, and it jumps off the page, and, and we, we see, oh, Lord, I don't see how you can do this. But if, if God says it, you can take it to the bank. You know it's going to occur. God's word always comes to pass. Sometimes the fear of stepping out in is what's hard. The fear of believing is going to be coming true. Oh my goodness, you don't know the situation I'm in. You don't know the problems I'm facing. I said, if I had anybody going through any problem situations, every hand's going to be going up. You know what I mean? We're all going through things. Every one of you. If sometimes it was just an effort just to get up this morning to get out to come to church for some of us. But you made that choice to come. And I just think about that. You know what I mean? I know Jesus, Jairus didn't say, Jesus said it, I believe it. But that's kind of my motto, you know. Jesus said it, I believe it. That's what Jairus did. He believed Jesus. Many times there's going to be this battle in our lives between fear and faith also, guys. Always realize that. God's word says this. Are we going to stand up and believe it and trust it? We're going to raise our kids in these areas. Are we going to share with people what it means that God says it, I believe it? But when he comes to the house, <clears throat> praise God, he shows up. And what's happening is there. People are playing flutes, and they're just crying and sobbing. It says in Job 30, Job 30, 31, my harp is turned to mourning, and my flute to the voice of those who weep. And what would happen when, when somebody would pass away, uh, flute players would be hired, and professional mourners would come, and they would just start crying and wailing at this at this. The situation that's happened, and they could turn it on, and they could turn it off, and they could, and the louder the wail, and you got more money, you can just get this huge, uh, ostentatious uh, display for a price. It's not sincere; it's just what they do. It's just part of the culture, and we see that there's no sincerity because in verse 24, when he said to them, "Hey, make room." For the girl is not dead, but is sleeping. They ridiculed him. Ridicule means they, they, they turned it off and they started laughing at him to scorn. There's no sincerity here, going from mourning to laughter in a scornful, hurtful way. And so Jesus says when the crowd was put outside, when he took away all those people who don't believe, get out of here. He went in and he took her by her hand and the girl arose and the report of this went out to all the land. Now Luke <clears throat> embellishes a little bit more on the story. And Luke wrote in uh, Luke 8, 51, when he, that Jesus, came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except his inner three, Peter, James, and John, and the father, that's Jairus, and the mother of the girl. And he <clears throat> put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called to her, saying, he's saying to this dead girl, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she should be given something to eat. I like that. Taking her by the hand, Jesus said, little girl, arise. Romans 4.17 says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as if they 
did, and that's what Jesus did. Jesus called to this dead girl and gave life to the dead, and her spirit returned to her, and she was raised from the dead. And Jesus can do that because Jesus is God. He can speak to the girl as if she were alive and give life to the death. I like this definition. I think this is a really good biblical definition of death. Death is when the spirit leaves the body. When the spirit leaves is when the heart stops. Is it when brain waves? I mean, you got all these signs, right? It says the spirit returned to her. That means the spirit had departed. Now, for a spirit to return is only going to be by a miracle. Because <clears throat> you know how many times a person dies? Once. Really dies once unless, unless there's a miracle. It says Hebrews 9.23 says it is appointed for men to die what? Once. And after this, there's going to be judgment. And so I like this biblical definition of death. I've been with some people and family members where all of a sudden you kind of go, they're not there anymore. No, they're gone. You know, their spirit's gone. They departed. You know what I mean? And you, you just know that they've left at that time. Matthew 9, 27 continues. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, a blind man came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. <clears throat> and their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him to all the country. So he leaves Jairus' house, and he's heading to another house. And as he's moving, these two blind men hear that Jesus is, is going. He's on their way. And they start, they start crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, this is quite a picture. Jesus is going from one house. He says he's going to another house. And these two blind men are following him, what? In the streets. Maybe asking people, where did Jesus go or what happened? They're just screaming out loud. They were determined to follow him to the best of their ability. As you're shouting, Son of David, Son of David is a messianic title. It refers to the Messiah, the one that's to come, the Christ. And they're shouting this out, and it's pretty important because they're making this open recognition that Jesus is the Son of David, that Jesus is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. They believe this. And the reason why that's pretty significant is John 9.22 says the Jews had agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, what would happen? He would be put out of the synagogue. He would say, leave our church. You're out of here. If you're going to say that Jesus is the Christ and you're not going to be part of us, these guys cared less. They, they knew who Jesus was. Though they were blind, they weren't blind to the truth of who Jesus was. They cared less about what spiritual costs and stating that Jesus was the coming son of David, the expected Messiah, that believed that Jesus, the promised Messiah, would give them mercy. The mercy is not getting what you deserve. We deserve justice, right? We deserve the wages of our sin is death. We deserve eternal damnation. But he gives us what? Mercy. What we don't deserve. I always want mercy. I really don't, you know, when I get pulled over by a cop, I'll say, okay, give me justice. I don't want that. I don't want that. Okay, I won't have mercy. Have grace in your eyes. I don't get pulled over a lot. I don't want you to think that, but I just... <clears throat> but I want mercy. That's where I want to live. <clears throat> and I like it, verse 28, when he had come to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. A simple response to their faith. And he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you, and their eyes were open. As Jesus was touched by their faith, the blind men were touched by Jesus. And although these men were blind men, their faith was not blind faith. They knew exactly to follow Jesus. That means they weren't going to go some other paths. They're going to do the best of their ability to follow the Lord they identified with Jesus. They knew who he was. They cried out, you are the Messiah. You are recognizing him. And they asked Jesus for mercy, something they didn't deserve. And they believed that Jesus was able to heal him. Yes, 
you are the object of my faith. Not faith in faith, but faith in you, Lord Jesus. It's amazing how these stories have people constantly pursuing and pursuing and pursuing in faith, right? The woman pursuing him, these men pursuing him. And that's what we see here. And it says, verse 30, and their eyes were opened and Jesus sternly warned them saying, see that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all the country. There are some people who said, oh, they shouldn't have done that. I, Jesus said not to do it. If I, was, if I was blind and now I see, you can see that I can what? See, because I was previously what? Blind. How did you get blind? I can't tell you. What? Because the one who healed me said, don't say nothing. Jesus! It was Jesus! He healed me. You want to know the good news? God wants you to shout it from the mountaintops. He wants to hear your testimony now. I was blind spiritually, but now I see. My eyes have been opened in a way I never thought possible. So when you come to the Lord, it's like, I never saw the world through the eyes of Jesus. I never saw through the eyes of his word. Of his word. And we read in verse 32, and then they went out, and behold, they then brought to him a man. He was mute. He was demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it's never been like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler, by Satan, the ruler of the demons. <clears throat> I think it's interesting that they went out and they now bring to him a man who's mute, who's demon-possessed. Now, there was a belief back in those days by the rabbis, by those who exercised demons, cast out demons, that the way to cast out demons was to figure out what the name of the demon was. And if I knew what the name of the demon was, it provided a handle, a way, a process for me now to then cast out, exercise this demon. Previously, when Jesus was over uh, with the two men in the Gadarenes graveyard on the other side of the Galilee, Mark 5 said, Jesus said, what is your name? And they answered, saying, my name, these are the demons, are legion, for we are many. So the, the, uh, the Jewish people would say, well, Jesus knows their names. So now that's a handle, and that's how we, they cast out demons by knowing that. Well, what if you were a smart demon, and you entered someone, and you made that person mute? He can't talk. Now, when you try to figure out the name of the demons, can you? No, because the man what? can't talk. So it would be impossible to exercise the demon out of this man, according to what? The Jewish thinking. These smart rabbis, they're not going to, they brought this guy to him. He's not going to be able to do that. Well, Jesus had no problem correcting this false teaching. Verse 33 says, and when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and everyone marveled. It was never done like this, seen like this here in Israel. Jesus shows his power over the entire demonic realm, but he also shows us the fallacies and the weaknesses in these Jewish teachers' teachings. It has nothing to do with knowing their name. It has to do with the power of God. So what are these Jewish people are going to do? Are they going to be like the blind men and saying, oh my goodness, this is the son of David. This is the Messiah. We choose to bow down to you. Are you going to be like Nicodemus, one of the Jewish rulers, who said, no one has done these works that you can do and not be of God? No, that's not what they do. Instead, what they say is, well, he casts out demons because he's in line with the ruler of the demons. He's hanging out with Satan. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's amazing how someone can be so religious and so stupid and so blind and ignorant they know all about the rituals and the things, but they're spiritually blind to what God's word is saying and what is actually happening. Second Corinthians says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. That's what Satan does. He wants to blind your eyes. He closes your eyes. It takes the work of him to open up your eyes who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should sign on them. When you come into the realization of the good news of Jesus Christ, and, he's, and you just yield your life to him, your eyes become open in a whole new way. And you go, I've never seen things like this. I've never seen God's word. It's jumping off the page. It's alive. It's quick. But when you're spiritually blind, you start rationalizing and justifying everything else. We're all good people. All roads lead to God. There is no hell. Jesus can do this because he hangs out with Satan, whatever stupid thing you're going to say. And so what happens is they stay spiritually blinded. Jesus puts it this way. For a judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see 
like the blind men may see. And that those who do see, like the Pharisees, remain what? Blind. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Two blind men who can't physically see what Jesus is doing trust and yield their life to him. And two people who've been reading the Old Testament and should be looking for the Messiah to come, who said he's going to open the eyes of the blind, he's going to heal the leper, they stay spiritually blind. I know some of us look and we see all these things of the Lord returning and the things happening, and you go, how can the world be so blind? Because the God of the age has what? Blinded this. We're in a spiritual battle. We've got to pray the Lord opens the eyes. I was planning on finishing this chapter. I'm not going to because we're going to have communion. And so we'll pick it up. So the title had to do with the next couple of verses. And so we'll, we'll, we'll pick that up. But uh, we're going to jump into communion. So can I uh, go ahead and have uh, those that are passing up the communions? Uh, Daniel, Buddy, Benny, and Ian, come on up here. Communion is a time where we stop what we're doing, we worship the Lord, we participate in the juice and the cracker, the elements of communion, but it's a time where we stop and remember what Jesus has done. We don't want to ever forget that. That, that always goes back, because if you, if you move from that place, you start getting into thinking it's about you or becoming this whole religious thing. It's always about this relationship through Christ, what he has done for each one of us. And if you've never said, Lord Jesus, I yield my life to you, if you question, maybe you thought, but you aren't too sure, you say, God, I want to give my life to you. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I'm going to give you an opportunity. You can be watching our life and say, Lord, I don't want to have any doubts. God, I'm going to give my life to you. I believe your death and your resurrection and your power over sin, you died for me. And I thank you for that. Let's pray. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, uh, for each one of us here. And, but for those who don't know you, who's never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, but you want to step a step, step of faith and you say, Lord, I want to give my life to you. I'm going to trust in you. Is there anyone here this morning who would like to do this? Put your hand up and say, yes, Lord. If you're watching online, just say yes. Thank you. Just give your life to the Lord. But if you're here also and you are saved, you've asked Jesus Christ in your life, but you, you want some prayer. You're going through a difficult time, or you, maybe there's some areas in your life that you just want to ask God for forgiveness before we take the sacraments, or, or there's just some extra prayer for healing or, or just for wisdom, or you want some prayer before we take the sacraments. Lift up your hand. Is anyone here this morning? Thank you, sister. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Let's pray for each other. Father, we do pray, Lord, that you would just do that work, Father that you would just give us the wisdom, Lord, that you touch us. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We want to be right before you, Father. And we just yield every aspect of our life. God, do that work, Father. May you be glorified in and through our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.